Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Ab Haas and with me here today is Team 7172 Technical Difficulties. They're in our Ochoa division, currently floating around the top four. I'm sure they're going to have some fantastic matches tomorrow, but for now I'm here to jump into this robot. It is just crazy. A lot of people have said it's the favorite FTC bot they've ever seen and I am definitely one of those people. This is just absolutely insane. I can't wait to get into it on Behind the Bot. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your educational robotics needs. From mechanical, electrical, tools, and hardware, Animark has over 200 years of first-team experience and offers high-quality and affordable solutions for the robotics mobility and competition markets. Head on over to Animark.com to get started. All right, guys, let's start with just an overall game discussion. You know, we've seen a lot of different robots, subsystems, just designs from you guys this season overall, and it requires a lot of work to come up with a completely different strategy or a completely different implementation each time. So walk me through how you guys decided on your first strategy for the game and how it's changed throughout the season. So this actually isn't the first robot we came up with. We had something almost Cookie Bot style, uh, an extending intake with a really horrid transfer for us, and it never really worked. Uh, we saw this one arm robot on, I think, the Discord, and we put it in CAD, decided to add a second one because we had space, and then said, why not split the drivetrain in half and see what we can do with that. Yeah, sure. And so just like talking about the autonomous and the game overall, you know, did you decide to split the robot in half because of the two auto stacks or because of some game strategy that you thought would be really important? How did that come about? So one of the big things was definitely uh, hoping to do a 1 plus 10 in auto, which is still in the works, by the way, hopefully for MTI if we get in. But it's also uh, for anti-defense measures in case anyone tried to block us or we didn't want to move to any different mode. Mm -hmm. uh, just more adjustability, too. Yeah. All right. No, that's perfect. So let's jump into your drivetrain. Uh, you know, it's not just a standard go build a mechanic drivetrain. There's a lot going on here. So walk us through it. Um, so basically, it's a standard go build a mechanism drivetrain. We just kind of split it in half. Um, we have an extension of five feet with a drivetrain. They can go up to five feet apart. Um, wow, yeah. And so what challenges did you face with that from the perspective of wiring, electrical, software, any of that? Um, so wiring, the biggest, it really was pretty simple. If you see our blue wiring, um, we actually put a tape measure in the sleeve to hold structure to it. Uh, so they hold really well. Um, one of the biggest parts was that lock servo right there. It's spring-loaded shut, so it takes no power to hold it together. But when we want to pull it apart, that servo opens it. Fitting that in was pretty difficult, too, with the battery. Yeah, and have you guys had a match where you thought you've had to use it, or do you think there will be a match at Worlds where you think you'll have to use it? So we actually used it earlier today when a cone was dropped into our robot. Um, and that is one of the nice features of it too, that it's an easy uh, evacuation plan, you could say. Yeah, of course, of course. All right, so let's uh, talk about the rest of your robot. You know, let's start with the turreting base for your arm. Mm -hmm. Um, the turret's actually really simple. Again, go build a, it's the uh, go build a... Super Duty Worm Kit? Yes, okay. that's it. Um, we had a little bit of issues with the worm gears, uh, but honestly, super simple. And yeah, Let's okay. talk about your first pivot and how does it work? Okay, well that's, um, that's just a 10 to 1 gearbox off of Amazon. It's also a worm gearbox. Um, it's actually supposed to be used on CNC machines, um, which is why we put it on the robot. I mean, we have a four foot long arm, so any slack we have in that first pivot is going to be huge at the end. Mm -hmm. And so with a worm gear, I feel like something teams have faced in the past are backlash issues. Is this something you guys also saw or not really? Yeah, so the output shaft, one thing we did, um, the backlash was definitely a huge issue. The output shaft at the bottom of that, um, we actually had some trouble with it, so we took it out put JV Weld on it to tighten up the tolerances and it definitely eliminated the majority of it. Sure, and then now another thing I want to touch on there are those constant, or the torsion springs. They are just absolutely massive. How did you guys decide on those and just the fact that you needed them? Well, we used like some JVN calculations to see how much weight is there going to be, how much are we going to have to pick up. Um, we knew that with an arm lifting that's going to be four feet, four feet out, right, you're going to need some help. And so we slapped some spring on. So actually, um, a little bit 
too strong. It takes force for the motor to go down all the way. Okay. Um, but that's better than not being able to lift up. Yeah, and so now let's uh, talk a little bit about the sensors and software behind all of this. So how do you guys know the position and location of your turret and your first pivot arm? You know, do you just start it in the same location every time or is it some absolute positioning system? So um, we kind of figured that that would be an, uh, something that we would have to solve from the beginning. So actually the turret and first pivot have absolute potentiometers on them. Um, the, the first pivot has one on the out output shaft. Um, so that, that's how we can figure out the position at the beginning of our programs. Um, beyond that, uh, the other sensors we have are distance sensors on the side of the robot that we use for autonomous so that we can stop accurately by aligning to the poles. Yeah, and so let's uh, talk a little bit about a little bit more about those potentiometers. You know, uh, from from what I know, potentiometers will just return to you an output voltage that they're reading. So, for our teams out there, how did you convert that to an angle? position or a distance that you could use later uh, in the rest of your software? So initially our first idea was to basically just get uh, the motor encoder position as well as the potentiometer voltage in two different places and uh, use that as a linear interpolation. interpolation sure. Um, but the problem with that is that the control and uh, expansion hubs, they don't read potentiometer voltages linearly. So the way that we solve that is we go through a calibration process. And what that is, is basically like we switch sweep the range of the first pivot as well as the turret and during that sweep uh, periodically we'll uh, note the motor encoder position as well as the, uh, the potentiometer voltage mm -hmm. so to generate a lookup table. Yeah and so how has that worked out for you this season? Have you guys had any issues with your potentiometer readings or just uh, data and positioning info of your turret and pivot or is this a solution you plan to implement for many years in the future? Um, this is probably something that we'll use in the future. We haven't had many issues with it. Um, it's fairly accurate. The The only reason that we would need to recalibrate is if there's some major hardware change or if the potentiometer turns or something like that. Sure. Yeah, and I think your first pivot and turret haven't changed too much this season, yep. but something that has gone through a couple iterations is the second stage of your arm. You know, we saw just another arm rotational pivot stage, but now we see these linear slides. So let's talk about that. Why did you guys first switch from the second arm to the linear slides? Uh, so one big issue we faced earlier when we had that second pivot there um, was so we already have slack in that first pivot, but adding another joint like that added so much more slack. It over doubled the amount of uh, wiggle Backlash there was to our room. You guys had it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the linear extend was simply smoother, and honestly, it was a lot less complicated. It made our robot a lot more compact and easy to use too. Yeah, cool. And so I see you guys have two servos here, so you have two linear rails uh, for each stage. Uh, is that correct? Two 200, uh, two stage Masumi slides. Okay, I see. And so from a software perspective, are there any sensors you guys use or do you just trust the servo position because it's been reliable enough? Um, we mainly just trust the servo position. It has been uh, extremely accurate. Sure. Yeah. So let's go on to the next part of your claw or of your whole arm. So we have this pivot right here. Has that changed at all throughout the season and if so, how? Uh, the m only change I think and most recent change uh, to the third third pivot are our guide plates that we recently added. Um, they're really simple. Uh, the third pivot itself really hasn't changed. It's just an axon servo um, attached. Yeah, and so you haven't, you guys obviously know how to counter spring a subsystem, but you felt no need to counter spring these at all? Not okay. for these, not with the axons. Okay, got it. And so now going on to your wrist, is that what, what yeah. do you guys call this? We part? call yeah. this our wrist. Yeah, so uh, has it changed at all throughout the season? How does it work? Walk us through it. I mean, it, it's just a servo that turns. The only change has been this hard stop um, because we used to go outside of the range and the servo would like reset itself like 360 degrees away from where we needed it to be. Oh my god, we have had so many claw iterations. Um, this one actually opens to um, 135 degrees, so we're able to sit outside of the substation without uh, being inside so the other arm can score while um, and then immediately once that other arm drops, the other one can grab without having to move at all. Yeah, of course. And so I see you guys, it looks like a modified Looney Claw, is that 
correct? Yeah, we started there, but it didn't. It, for some reason, the Looney Claw just didn't totally work for us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and so now, how did you guys decide about the profile of uh, you know the new modified profile and with these little uh, rollers here, and how does all of that work? So one of the uh, issues, the reason that these little things. Oh, are you talking about the surgical tubing? Uh, or both. Those? Go ahead. Uh, so the surgical tubing was there for hold. We used grip tape, the same grip tape we used on our butterfly wheels last year. Mm -hmm. um, previously on our first grabbers, but we use blue, blue surgical tubing. These little teeth are there so that a cone wouldn't get these ones. Mm -hmm. are we used to have the cone get stuck between these two and not go in. I mean, these profiles are built specifically, so whether or not you grab the cone here or here, it'll funnel straight to the center. Yeah, awesome. And so now talking a little bit about the software behind all of this, how do you know where you are on the field? Are you guys using odometry or a different localization method? And how has that worked out for you this season? So our driving in autonomous, especially at this event, because we changed our path, has been extremely consistent. Um, we just use the driving coders and the motors, but we do utilize distance sensors on the side of our robot to align Where with the they? poles after we drive past them. Obviously, you had a very, very successful season last year in Freight Frenzy. I think you guys went 99-8, no unofficial matches or something just insane like that. So to using the lessons you learned from last season, what is some advice you have for teams looking to improve them in future years? Um, I think the, the biggest thing with any robot any season is consistency and even if you're not the most high scoring robot, if you have a consistent robot, that, that, that'll that win it for you, right? Yeah, for sure. Alright, technical difficulties, thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to talk about this just amazing, amazing robot. This has been absolutely fantastic. Reporting for First Updates now, I'm Abbas and with me is Team 7172's Technical Difficulties. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your educational robotics needs. From mechanical, electrical, tools, and hardware, Animark has over 200 years of first-team experience and offers high-quality and affordable solutions for the robotics mobility and competition markets. Head on over to Animark.com to get started. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.